I have 11 o'clock now. Um, All right. We now call to order the Countywide Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee meeting of Monday, May, July 26th at, at, what time is it here, 11 o'clock. Um, please give your attention to this short video. Beefy, I think you have a video you could show. Thank you. Due to COVID-19, this meeting will be conducted as a Zoom meeting pursuant to the provisions of the Governor's Executive Order N-2920, which suspends certain requirements of the Brown Act. This meeting is being live streamed on the CCTA website. The chair will call upon members, staff, and other speakers by name. Please speak clearly and state your name before giving comments or remarks. Persons participating via Zoom with their cameras enabled are reminded that their activities are visible to viewers. Members participating by Zoom wishing to speak should physically raise their hand and unmute their mic when called upon. Members should remute their mics when done speaking. Citizens participating by Zoom wishing to speak should use the raise hand feature or dial star 9 if participating via phone, and the chair or staff will call upon them at the appropriate time. Citizens will have three minutes to speak. A 30-second warning will be provided. After three minutes, staff will lower their hand and mute their mic. Participants via phone will be called upon by the last four digits of their phone number. It is requested that public speakers state their names and organization, but providing such information is voluntary. Written public comments received in accordance with the COVID-19 Special Notice for Public Comment Guidelines are printed on the meeting agenda. If authors of the written correspondence would like to speak, they should raise their hand and the chair will call upon them at the appropriate time. All written correspondence received after that and during the meeting will be entered into the record. A roll call vote will be taken for all action items. Thank you for participating in a meeting of the Contra Costa Transportation Authority. All right, next um, we'll take a roll call. So Fifi, if you could do that roll call now, please. When you hear your name, please let me know you're present. Committee member Arce. Alternate Filson. Lynn Filson. Sorry, had to find the unmute. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sean Diggin. Alternate Suzanne Wilson. Adam Foster. Here. David German. Lamar Karimi. Here. Bill Keeshan. Here. Marjorie McWee. Present. Bruce Ollie Olson. Present. Corey Riley. Here. Kristen Riker. Vice Chair Pinkham. Here. And Chair Sarmiento. Here. Thank you. All right, thanks, Fifi. Um, next item on the agenda is public comment. Uh, Fifi, have we received any public comment? We have not. Okay, thanks. If there's anybody in the meeting who wishes to speak during public comment on an item that is not part of the, of the agenda, if so, please raise your hand and I or staff will call upon you. All right, I don't think I see any hands, so we will move on to item three, the this item on the item three on the agenda is the approval of the consent calendar, which includes a summary of actions from the May 24, 2021 meeting. Uh, are there any changes, comments, et cetera, from the committee? If so, please raise your hand. All right, I don't see any hands raised. Um, is there anybody from the public who'd like to speak on this item? Please raise your hand. I don't think there. All right, no hands up. All right, I, I'll, I, I, do I have a motion? I need. I guess I need a motion by one of the committee members. So moved. All right, I have a motion by Bill. Do I have a second? I'll second. All right, second by uh, Adam. 
All right, uh, Fifi, if you could take the roll call, please. Okay, and I'm going to go through call, the entire... Yeah, yeah. Yes, to um, action. I'm going to go through the entire list. I saw some names pop up um, after a roll call. So, uh, committee member Filson? I need to abstain on the minutes. Okay. Dugan? Uh, I think I need to abstain too. I showed up late and I was not at the last meeting. Foster? Yes. German? Karimi? Yes. Keishan? McWee? Aye. Olson? Yes. Riley? Yes. Riker? Pinkham? Yes. Sarmienta? Yes. Motion passes uh, by majority present. All right, thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is review of the city of San Pablo's complete streets checklist. Colin, can you please introduce the city staff present? Sure, thanks and good morning everyone. So uh, this morning we have the city of San Pablo. We have Sarah Kalarik um, as the project manager to give us a presentation on the giant road cycle track project uh, in terms of the complete streets project checklist. And the idea is this checklist is part of the compliance with 2006 MTC resolution 3765. And so the countywide bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee has the ability to provide review and provide input on this project. So over to Sarah. Thank you, Colin. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I'll, I'll preface this that uh, this project may seem a little bit familiar to all of you because I did a presentation uh, a number of months back um, on this project in order uh, to prepare a TEA Article 3 grant application. So um, I can also uh, reference some of the comments that we received them and how we addressed uh, those comments in our uh, updated design. Um, so this uh, is the giant road cycle track and pavement repair project. So we are uh, combining two projects. Uh, the pavement repair project had been programmed um, for a couple of years. And uh, at this moment in time, we are working on a giant road um, draft concept design as part of a bicycle and pedestrian corridor study, so a broader plan. And we saw an opportunity to ad more quickly advance the safety improvements on this corridor in combination with this pavement repair project, since we'll be restriping, we'll be doing some changes anyway, so no better time um, than in conjunction with this project to more cost effectively and quickly implement some bicycle and pedestrian safety improvements. So to the right here, um, there is a high level Zoom or Google map of city of San Pablo. Um, the city boundaries aren't uh, outlined, but it's, um, if you can see my mouse, I'm roughly circling city boundaries. The uh, proposed giant road cycle track is this red uh, line. So getting into some project details. So the project extents um, are the full city of San Pablo um, extent of Giant Road. So that goes from Brookside Drive at the southernmost extent, and that's where it dead ends, up to Minor Avenue, which is the northernmost part, and that's roughly where the Richmond Parkway crosses over Giant Road. Um, further north of that, the uh, Giant Road, which then turns into Giant Highway, Highway, is in the city of Richmond. So from a high level, um, this would be a project that connects some northernmost areas, so Point Pinole. Um, there's some bikeway connections um, at around where it says um, Richmond Country Club. There's um, some other parallel facilities, a, a good bit, good bit um, to the west. Uh, further south, um, so there's in the purple an upcoming uh, Rumrow Boulevard Complete Streets project, and that is a project um, where construction is going to be starting this fall. 
And so then with that facility um, and an upcoming project by the city of Richmond to continue that complete streets work, uh, city of Richmond is currently in design for that project. Um, this giant road cycle track will provide a good north south connection to these complete streets facilities that can then get people um, into Richmond, um, fairly close to the BART station and other uh, Richmond amenities like um, Kaiser and also their downtown area. The proposal is primarily a class four, um, but at the end points, we'd be transitioning to a class two just to facilitate um, the connection to uh, one lane in each direction, um, giant highway segment where there are no bicycle facilities at present. Um, and the whole uh, segment is 1.1 miles. And as I mentioned, it is currently a concept design um, in the bicycle pedestrian corridor study. I can show some uh, segments of that design after I run through these high level details. This road has also been identified for as needing improvements in our general plan um, and that was as of 2011 so this has been a segment that's on the city's radar as needing improvements um, it is a the existing conditions are one drive lane in each direction with a center turn lane that runs for the whole stretch of the road um, on the western side of the road it is bnsf railroad frontage so the center turn lane doesn't really provide much value for that western side. On the eastern side, there are a few cross streets. Um, some of the uses on the eastern side of the road include um, some commercial uses. There's an elementary school um, where the play fields front the giant road and then some residential areas. Based on this road being fairly low traffic volumes, um, preliminary analysis from our consultant suggests that we really don't need that center turn lane and that, in fact, it encourages much higher roadway speeds um, than is safe for that road. So the high level proposed conditions are this two way cycle track where it would be class four separated protected um, both directions on the western side. So adjacent to the BNSF railroad for the full extent. There are some discussions that we're currently um, going through right now with BNSF to figure out the best intersection configuration at the one signalized intersection along this roadway. So it's possible that we'd want to revise this proposed concept to have the two-way cycle track on the eastern side of the road if it ultimately makes the intersection that is um, signalized and the trickiest uh, uh, conflict point. If it makes that safer, then we will adjust the full uh, concept plan accordingly. Um, we also haven't at this point determined the uh, delineation, type of delineation we will be using, but we will have this be a separated and protected um, facility. So there will be this full striped buffer as well as some sort of vertical delineator um, that makes it both safer and then also uh, clearly communicates to vehicles that they're not supposed to be driving or parking in this bicycle facility. Um, so uh, an aerial image of this giant road um, project extent, there's the commercial giant road chain center up here. We've talked with them about this project and ultimately they, they don't have any major issues. They've given us some comments that we're uh, incorporating into the design. There's some multifamily affordable housing adjacent to it. This is the elementary school, as I've mentioned, and then a couple of major cross streets. So as far as funding goes, the full project, now that we're learning some, uh, learning about additional elements that we'll have to include uh, per the conversations with the BNSF Railroad and California Public Utilities Commission, as far as railroad safety goes, um, we're looking at about 1.5 million. And that includes the pavement maintenance project that was, um, originally planned just for part of the project extent. So that's from Brookside Avenue to Trenton Boulevard. And so we're including that as far as the broader project cost because we would be um, mobilizing, constructing this all as one. We are recommended for award for 150,000 of TDA3 funding. And then we are working to figure out if we're uh, gonna be able to secure 
uh, safe and seamless regional funding um, funds for this project. So we're finishing the checklist of items that MTC has provided us. And so we're recommended for award, uh, hoping a final award this fall. We would then be uh, finishing design, um, putting together the bid package this winter and then constructing it next year. Some high level comments about um, project benefit and I've summarized um, many of those. So I'm not actually gonna read off that list, but just highlighting the map, um, which shows the MTC communities of concern um, from 2020 with the highest community of concern being that pink uh, and then various thresholds. So the gray uh, area is not a community of concern. Here we have city of San Pablo boundaries mapped out. So the entire city of San Pablo does classify as an MTC community of concern and the frontage along giant road is one of the higher communities of concern. Um, this also facilitates regional connections safe active transportation connections among communities of concern. Um, and then I do, so with this presentation, I just have contact information, but I do want to highlight the giant and par intersection, which I think is really the most challenging part of this design and probably where there would be majority of comments. And then I would happily um, like to receive comments from the CB PAC, and if interested, we can also do some discussion of previous comments that I've received from CB PAC. So moving along um, the giant road corridor, this intersection with Road 20 and Par Boulevard is the most challenging since you can see these railroad tracks are immediately adjacent to the intersection. Even though the proposed improvements wouldn't actually cross the railroad, tracks, um, there are additional steps that we need to be taking as a city in order to meet MUTCD requirements as, it call, as they relate to railroad crossings. And there's um, approvals that we need to receive from BNSF Railroad, as well as the CPUC as part of this project. So the exact configuration of this intersection striping may change um, based on what we receive from them as far as preliminary comments go, but we are in discussion and um, they are overall supportive of this project and appreciate the fact that it will more cl clearly delineate um, safe travel for cyclists and where vehicles should be traveling. Um, with that, I would like to open up for any questions or comments. All right, thank you, Sarah. If any of the CBPAC members have any questions, please raise your hand. Uh, I do see a hand up from Margie. Hi, it's very helpful to have your presentation. And I am just curious um, from a perspective of somebody who might not be on a bicycle, but is using some other mobility device, such as a wheelchair, um, what the vision is to make this safe from a path of travel for those types of individuals, so ADA access, that type of thing. Yeah, that's great. Um, so on the stretch, as part of the pavement improvements, we'll also be doing curb route improvements, which unfortunately is needed since there are a few corners which are currently don't have a curb ramp. So of course, just having a few locations does mean that uh, the broader quarter as a whole becomes much less accessible because even one pinch point um, becomes a problem. So we'll be doing curb ramp repairs on the eastern side, which is where there's the sidewalk um, continuation. Uh, we'll also be doing new crosswalk striping, which um, in some cases there isn't crosswalk striping. So again, that'll make it more clear to motorists where they need to be stopping, where they need to be giving clear space for pedestrians. Um, with the overall corridor safety, um, one of the major concerns is that people really do speed on Giant Road and that middle uh, turn lane unfortunately is used as a passing lane. So vehicles go quite quickly. So the hope with having this two-way cycle track also tightening the road width, uh, the drive lane widths a little bit overall will provide uh, some traffic calming and just having vehicles traveling at slower speeds will provide benefits for broader bicyclist safety. I mean, all, all road users. 
Well, and I, I think it's important to think about at those intersections or the point where an individual coming out of one of those neighborhoods and trying to join in, I think those often get overlooked, mm -hmm. especially if you're expecting them to cross over to maybe use the, the bike area as the path of travel. Getting across to that can be very dangerous, if, especially if a person's below sight line. So I would just ask that you, you know, pay attention to those details as well. Thank you for that. I see a hand up from Oli. Yeah. Uh, my question is about the actual divider between the cycle track and the vehicle tracks. Uh, I gather that you haven't yet decided what you're going to put there. I'd like to throw in the thought that concrete K rail would be the hottest of the hot setups. But if that doesn't get put down, and I realize it's going to be expensive if it does, what, uh, what are you going to, if you put in the uh, plastic delineators, do you have any method of maintaining them identified? Please, that's yeah. my question. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, yes, as far as dividers go, um, so in part why we haven't committed to that yet is because we knew that we would be getting additional comments and additional items um, from CPUC and BNSF for intersection improvements, which means that we're overall from a budget perspective, um, aren't, we're not able to commit to having the concrete um, K-rails or a, some sort of curb uh, delineator. Right now, one of the preliminary thoughts is doing K71 bollards, um, potentially in combination with another, another um, lower, more sturdy barrier, but then K71s provide the vertical visual indicator as well as the reflectivity. So it's very obvious to motorists. Um, something that we have in mind for driver consistency is what City of Richmond is using just because City of San Pablo and City of Richmond boundaries are so um, hard to delineate that we want to have some consistency for drivers um, so that they clearly understand this is a bicycle lane, understand the behavior that's expected of them. Also from an internal city maintenance perspective, we are not jumping into picking a certain divider without thinking across all of the projects that we're working on, um, bicycle traffic safety related improvements. We want to have a delineator that we are good using across all of the projects and that we know we'll be able to maintain if we have one item or just two items that we're trying to keep in stock and continually maintain that makes it a lot easier for us to be able to stay on top of that maintenance and for our maintenance team to know how to address any safety improvements. All right, any other questions or comments for Sarah? Hey. All right, I see a hand from, uh, I'll go with Sean first and then I'll go with Adam after. Sean. Thanks, Robert. Um, and thanks, Sarah, for the presentation. I was trying to raise my hand, but I ac accidentally clapped, but it was also a good <laughs> presentation. Um, the, uh, so just a couple of things I wanted to confirm. So this is about a mile. Yes. And it's from Brookside to Minor. Correct. Okay, so and there's no um, there's no railroad crossing included in this um, project there, at all. Correct, because in um, city of San Pablo, it's Giant Road is just adjacent to the railroad and and doesn't actually cross. Um, okay. In that intersection, just to provide some more context, the boundaries are very interesting with San Pablo and Richmond. So the intersection that I had the concept design. Um, being shared, that intersection is actually partially in city of Richmond. And so a number of the striping changes would actually be taking place in city of Richmond. So I've been working with Patrick um, to make sure that he's involved in the design and city of Richmond it understands that it would be partially in their city and that um, we have a MOU sorted out for that. So because of that, we aren't actually doing any uh, actual crossings since mm -hmm. that isn't our jurisdiction. I, yeah, I, I would think that would be one of the most challenging parts if you did add it. Um, the two, okay, two more things. The it looks like the majority of the way um, 
that the sidewalk width is is three, maybe five feet at the most on the east side, and it there's utility poles and everything like right in the middle. Is there any um, so back to to Margie's kind of comment on ADA and accessibility? Um, the, there are there any pedestrian uh, up to, uh, improvements on the east side being planned? Um, so aside, so there are curb ramp improvements along the whole way on the stretch between Brookside and Trenton, um, where that has the pavement maintenance project going on. I think there will be uh, many greater or many more sidewalk improvements taking place in that area. On the northern stretch, um, that's something that we'll have to be looking at as part of budget. So unfortunately, um, we're not able to commit right now to doing um, any major sidewalk changes, but that is part of our calculation as far as which side of the road the cycle track is taking, is gonna be located on. So, and there's various advantages to having it on either side. On the western side, there are fewer conflict points, um, but some of those conflict points are a little bit trickier since they're adjacent to the railroad and there can't be yeah. stop signs or uh, controlled flow of vehicles coming um, from the western side of the cycle track on the east. If the cycle track was located on the eastern side, it would provide the benefit of basically expanding out that bicycle pedestrian space. Um, and providing an extra barrier for pedestrians, but then there's also more intersection conflicts. So yeah. um, as far as the, the broader location, we have those elements in mind as in the analysis. Okay, and sorry, I have so many questions. Um, so la I think my last question for now is, um, so at the, at the PAR, oh, was it PAR, where, where you, you showed your last graphic where it's really close yeah. to the railroad? Um, yes, so the intersection, the one signalized intersection with PAR. Okay, so that, that, yeah. so that, will that be, um, so we're, I, I'm working with UP, not BNSF right now, but okay. a very similar, very challenging situation where you have a longitudinal crossing to the flow of the trains. And their biggest concern is, you may know this already, is, is cars having to stop for a pedestrian or bicyclist going across and queuing into the, the railroad track yes. um and is that is that um section that you just showed is that a is that um free-flowing pedestrians or will they will they be controlled there with a signal I, i'm sorry yes. if you mentioned that already no i didn't and that's a good question that is a yeah an ongoing discussion that we're having yeah. right now with cpc and we're and we're working on some preliminary signal timing to have an understanding of um how the timing would interact with the railroad preemption requirements that they have. So at this point, um, as far as timing goes, so on the, the Eastern side is the only location where there is sidewalk right now. And BNSF was very uncomfortable with having any sidewalk or pedestrian amenities on the Western side adjacent to the railroad, which I think that's fairly consistent um, in any jurisdiction. Um, with the bicycle lanes that are on that Western side. So that's part of the um, intersection safety consideration and signal timing analysis that we're doing. So if there are bicyclists crossing, how does that impact turning movements for vehicles that are coming across the railroads? That would be the main queuing um, issue. Otherwise for bicyclists that are going north south, um, motorists would have a red light at that point. So there sh they should be following the clear space requirements, but that there would probably need to be a new signal phase in order to be able to safely accommodate that or an adjustment to signal timing. So that is part of our analysis and that could impact um, which side we have the bicyclists on in the intersection just to make it safer for everybody involved. Great, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. All right, we had, uh, Adam had his hand up earlier, Adam. Yep. Uh, Sarah, this is an A project in my mind, and you gave an A presentation. There's so many neat things going on in your area right now for complete streets, and I'm glad that you're there helping out with it. Uh, my only comments were, it seems like for me as a person who bikes, 
if you're able to get the cycle track on the west side uh, of the road there, it would be preferable just because fewer crossings. Uh, as far as if you end up on the west side and connecting to the side streets there, uh, perhaps the Napa Vine Trail, uh, I see some similarities here, could be something that could be used as a comparable. Uh, in particular, Solano Avenue and Orchard Avenue could give you an example where I think they've done a pretty good job to, to Margie's comment with an ADA accessible curb ramp that flows pretty well, given that this could be a, a low volume street with potentially low volume bike traffic too. I, I think that could be something good to look at. And then my only other comment kind of to, to all these comments about the materials is my thinking, and I gave a similar comment to the city of Pittsburgh not too long ago, is if there are any opportunities to integrate uh, community art, given that you're going to have a long stretch here that might be invited to the bad guys, more inviting to the bad guys more than the good guys, using crime prevention through environmental design of incorporating some sort of public art could benefit the community and, and improve the longevity and, and reduce maintenance. But great project. Great job. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Adam. And I really appreciate that specific um, recommendation. So we'll be taking a look at that. Yeah, I'm glad I got to go third. So I had time to pull it up on Street View. <laughs> All right. oh, Margie has a hand up. Margie. Um, Sarah, I just wanted to um, offer to do kind of like a walk audit with you of that location from a wheelchair user's perspective. Because, you know, one of the things we found when we did the walk audit a couple weeks ago is it's really different when you're kind of boots on the ground and if we could do that while you're in your design phase it might help kind of test out some of the ideas that you have thank you i appreciate that offer and i'll jot that down and once we, i think right now once we do some initial meetings with bnsf and cpc then we'll have um our revised sense of how the intersection is the main signalized intersection is going to work and then how that changes um, which side the overall design is configured on. Well, because, you know, to Sean's point, sometimes, you know, especially if you're doing everything off of aerial views or whatever, you don't pick up that the clearance between a pole and a fence is not enough for somebody to get by in a wheelchair or that they might walk into it if they were visually impaired or whatever. And sometimes it's just being there and seeing how somebody actually interacts with a space that you kind of go, oh, wait, that's not going to work the way we thought it would. So. Thank you. All right, I have a virtual hand up from Bill Keishin. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so this this may seem like it's totally out there. But it's kind of my pet peeve. Um, uh, have we just gravitated towards green being the color for, for bikes? Um, one one of the reasons why I'm totally interested in this subject is um, if you travel around Amsterdam, they've, they've used more of a, a reddish color, which is really nice from the standpoint that as you get into the little towns, um, it transitions really well to very nice brick surfaces and things like that. And I was just wondering, um, has there ever been a study on, on using those kinds of colors when it comes to the roads? I, I mean, that would be an interesting thing kind of at a broader level at this point. Um, yeah, I, since, I know. yeah, in the Bay Area, red has definitely been used for bus access. We're sticking with um, consistent paint colors and keeping with the green right. that other jurisdictions are using. But it is, I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of great articles and information about how um, Europe uh, has color coded things, and it yeah, it is interesting. It is very different than the approach that okay, we've just, been taking in the Bay Area. Yep. Okay. I, I'm just talking like in Danville or in, in Alamo and these little towns. Um, it could be much more charming if there was if there was flexibility there. But but I I can also see that once the once the train has left the station, it's pretty hard to change all that. Yeah, and this one, I know that in the next round of MUTCD um, issuance, they're working to formulate, formalize um, more of the paint and um, design requirements around bike and um, bus access and, and lanes. So yeah, the train is definitely 
full steam ahead, at least out here. All right, next I have a hand up from Bill Pinkham. Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing about the training. Um, the, yeah, at this point, uh, a lot of, um, not only is it universal, but drivers are much more familiar, with it, bicyclists are much more familiar with it and they'd be, they'd be very confused if there were new colors added, um, even if it's in small communities, because if you're riding from one to the other, you know, you'd see that. But um, I agree that it'd be interesting to see a study of that, but I don't think at all we want to um, use anything but the green and the buffered lanes. So. All right, thanks, Bill. Um, any other questions or comments for, for Sarah? Don't see any hands up. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Colin, this is just an informational item, correct? Yes, that's right. Okay. All right, if no other questions or comments, uh, thank you for the uh, presentation, Sarah. And we will move on to the next item on the agenda. It is an update on the countywide bicycle and pedestrian plan implementation and development of the countywide Vision Zero framework and countywide pedestrian needs assessment. And I think, Colin, is this your item to present? Yes. All right. uh, so, in terms of the 2018 bike and ped plan update, uh, there were three main priorities that were. Uh, selected by the CCTA board to focus on, one of which being the Vision Zero, uh, development of a countywide Vision Zero for a consistent approach. Um, so that is uh, being finalized as we speak and uh, being put into staff report form for consideration by the planning committee uh, on September 1st and the board uh, later in September. Um, the, in, in terms of the, the general bike and ped plan implementation, uh, there are uh, some other things being considered for potential scope, uh, you know, inclusion in terms of tasks. Um, in, in particular, um, the Senate Bill 288, which is now law that helps streamline uh, transportation projects in terms of CEQA environmental review um, and prioritizing projects. So um, open to other ideas too. That's it for this item. Thank you, Colin. Does, does any, any of the committee members have uh, questions or comments for Colin on this item? Can the public comment on this? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Can the public comment on this item? Okay, or yeah, we'll... Uh, all right, um, Eric, yeah, we'll, um, I'll get the public comment in a second here. Let me um, go through committee comments and then I'll, I'll open Sorry, it up. Sorry, I can't figure out how to raise my hand on here. I don't know if I can do that. All right, um, yeah, Eric, I'll, I'll call on your... Call on the public in, in a minute here after um, hearing from the committee members. Uh, I'll, okay. I'll reach Thank you. I saw Oli first had his hands up. Yes, please. This is Oli speaking. I'd like to compliment CCTA's board and Colin. You probably had a hand in deciding that Vision Zero was important. I have to say our entire existence as an advisory committee should circulate around Vision Zero. If we build stuff that gets people killed, we're probably not doing what we are trying to accomplish. So thank you, Colin. Thank you, CCTA board. All right, thank you, Oli. Any other committee comments or questions? All right, seeing none, I'll open it up to the public if they have any questions or comments on this item. Yeah. Hi, this is Eric again. And uh, 
at the level that you create Vision Zero, what authority does this board have in actually implementing it at a local level? Does this setting this goal, how does that have any control like for the Pine Hollow project in Contra Costa Count in uh, Concord right now, where they're looking at designing roads. The road runs through two schools and is in dire need of bike lanes, pedestrian lanes, wheelchair lanes along big sections of it. But how does the county setting the standard actually affect any change to the local streets that are getting restriped, redone right now? Hi, uh, Colin, is that, if you'd be able to re provide a response to, to Eric's question? Yeah, sure. So uh, the so CCTA countywide has the countywide sales tax revenue from Measure J uh, that includes the uh, funding for two different programs, including uh, TLC transportation for livable communities and PBTF uh, pedestrian bicycle and trail facilities, and so. The thought is over time that uh, Vision Zero uh, may be incorporated into future calls for projects and that kind of thing, but it, it does uh, depend on what the board, the authority board decides in September in terms of next steps and priorities. And I guess there's other funding sources that do also encourage uh, Vision Zero uh, when designing projects. Um, and so in terms of projects that were, you know, planned and designed uh, a number of years ago, uh, there may be, uh, you know, a, a best effort from local agencies in terms of what they can do to address uh, Vision Zero. Is there anything others wanna add? Does anybody have any other um, more uh, response or comments for, for Eric on this item or on his question? Yeah, this is uh, John Huang, Director of Planning for CCTA. Um, thanks for the opportunity to respond to your question. Uh, Eric, yeah, I just want to add on what, what Colin said is right on the mark, but uh, ultimately the infrastructure are city owned, county owned. So CCTA does not own any infrastructure, but we do can't we can set policy on a countywide basis, and we encourage the cities and local jurisdiction to uh, set their own policy. Uh, we want to complement what cities do, not override them. And ultimately, um, what we do re uh, regards to trying to encourage and, uh, cities to do the Vision Zero is, is through the funding side. That Colin mentioned. Um, so to that point, um, I think um, uh, your point is well taken, Eric. All right, thank you, thank you, John. Um, any other questions or comments for Eric? Or Eric, do you have any other follow up? Yeah. So there's uh, there will be funding coming from you guys for projects in the future and you are currently setting that standard as far as the county but so then like there's a willow pass project tomorrow in meeting tomorrow in concord but you don't have any sort of direct authority or influence over that right now or do you have any authority or do you as the CCTA show up to that meeting and say, hey, we here's our set of standards that we think you should follow.
And then I will, I guess, just for clarification, what what funding source is are the cities applying for? And we are oh, right I, now we don't have any policy in place. No. Got it. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Eric. Um, any other comments on this item? All right, if no other comments, we'll move on to the next item, which is item C, an update on the July 7, 2021 publication of the Caltrans District 4 pedestrian plan for the Bay Area. And Colin, I think this is your item as well, correct? Yes, and I just wanted to be brief on this one, but just to highlight that uh, Caltrans District 4 for the Bay Area did uh, finalize their pedestrian plan. Um, with publication on July 7th. So definitely encourage our local agencies throughout Contra Costa to review the document and feel free to contact CCTA to discuss and let us know where there's areas for improvement and areas for partnership opportunities. All right, thank you, Colin. Uh, any, any committee questions or comments on, on this item? All right, seeing none, is there any public comment uh, on this item? Okay, don't see any hands raised, so thank you for that. We'll move on to the item D, um, update on the development of MTC's Bay Area Regional Active Transportation Plan. Colin? Yeah, so um, we're working with uh, Kara Oberg at MTC uh, in terms of uh, contributing to the Regional Active Transportation Plan. There's been a couple updates as of recently, one of which was compiling a number of different funding sources that are available for bike and ped type projects. Um, and so that's something that MTC's consultant is working on compiling as, as a resource for local agencies to be able to use. Um, and uh, let's see, there's also um, a second part. It'd be a good time to remind uh, local agencies, encourage uh, any, any local agencies that have updated their bikeways and walkways in terms of existing versus proposed locations, gap closures, class types, um, those types of things. It'd be helpful to have that information uh, communicated uh, to CCTA uh, so that we can consider it as part of a bike ped plan update because ultimately the countywide bike and ped plan update is what's being rolled up into uh, MTC's regional active transportation plan for uh, kind of prioritizing projects at a, at a regional level. Um, so if there's GIS layers, uh, and other data, um, I encourage our local agencies to, uh, you know, keep in touch with CCTA, make sure we have the latest and greatest. Um, I have shared what we have thus far uh, with MTC's consultant, which includes uh, the data that is from 2017 uh, that was used in the 2018 adopted countywide bike and ped plan. Um, and also uh, trip volumes, trip count data is another thing uh, that's being requested from, from local agencies. Um, the uh, congestion management uh, program did include sub trip count data for uh, bike and ped countywide. And I've shared that with MTC's consultant, um, including uh, East Bay Regional Parks District, the uh, trail counts through uh, calendar year of 2019. Um, so most, mostly uh, MTC is looking for the last five years or so, but anything would be helpful. All right, Thank, thanks for the up, update, Colin. Um, any, any committee members have any questions or, or comments for Colin on, on this item? Hi, Bill. Uh, yeah, uh, do we have 
any ballpark uh, estimate of uh, uh, what, how much money we're going to have? I, I don't mean to hold you to any exact figures, but um, have a have a feeling for that. And what, well, let's say how it will compare with previous years and so on. Any idea? I know they're working on it. But just wondering. Sure. So uh, through through the chair. Um, Colin Clark, CCTA staff. I we don't have that information yet from MTC, um, but I'll certainly keep this group um, updated when you know if and when we do get that type of specific details. Okay, it's a good question. Thank you. Soon the better. Yeah. All right. Uh, any any? Oh, I see uh, Sean's hand. Sean. Yeah. Uh, just a clarification, Colin. You're the for the. Uh, volume data you requested you you're requesting at this point now basically 2019 until present is is what would be helpful for you yes it, it sounds like mtc is looking at just the fat past five years and so for east bay regional park Dist park district uh we already have through 19 as far as i know um but you know if you're familiar with Kind of more detailed data than than what I emailed. Um, definitely open to talking about that more. Uh, yeah, we have our trail counter data that you send, and that that's I would we can shift that to the pre from present minus five years if that's helpful. But yeah, that's sounds, pretty much what we have. Yeah, that sounds great. And if you have a map of the counter locations uh, and, and also the I guess the GIS layer with data showing uh, geographically where those counters are located, that'd be super helpful. Thank you. Okay. All right, any other committee questions or comments? All right, seeing none, uh, is there any public comment on, on this item? All right. I don't see any hands up, so thank you, Colin. We'll move on to the next item here, which is an update on the MTC's Active Transportation Working Group. And Colin? Yeah, so um, the MTC Active Transportation Working Group did meet on June 24th. Um, I mentioned the Active Transportation Plan at the regional level, so that did include uh, much of the conversation in, in that meeting that we've, we've talked about, um, but it also did include an item about um, the active transportation program at the state level, uh, the augmentation update in terms of uh, half a billion dollars being uh, potentially available for additional projects who didn't yet receive funding through ATP cycle five uh, which the application was due last September of 2020. Um, so CCDA does have a project um, that still has the potential to get uh, funding through this. Um, it, there was, I think there were two pieces of legislation at the state level going through um, and the one that did make it and get signed uh, by the governor does require uh, a second action um, in order for that to become law and for uh, this project uh, in potentially to get funded. Um, so I'll certainly keep you updated if we hear more. Any questions or, or comments for Colin on, on this item? All right, I, actually Colin, I do have a question and maybe my apologies if I missed it. So with this half a billion, dollars that potentially could be available, how, when will it, I guess that be become official? Do you know when? So uh, if, if there is not a accompanying bill passed into law signed by, I wanna say mid-October, uh, so we, we should know by mid-October. Okay, and I also heard rumors too, you know, you mentioned half a billion. I've heard rumors that it could be go as high as a, one billion. Did that come up at the at the active transportation working group meeting, or is it just for now half a billion? 
for for now, I, I think um, it's the 500 million. Um, there was uh, some comments made by CTC commissioners that were encouraging of something like two or two and a half billion dollars. Uh, but I don't think that has yet resulted in um, legislation. So all you know, we'll we'll keep tabs on that. Okay, uh, thanks. Any other questions or any other committee questions or comments for for Colin? Okay, uh, any any public comment uh, on this item? All right. Seeing none, we'll move on to the next item, which is uh, other business. Is there any other business or information that the committee members or staff would like to share? All right, if there are, there are no, no items, actually I as the county rep would like to share an item that I've been asked to present today. The, the county is currently working on an active transportation plan. Um, in the, yeah, working on developing an act, active transportation plan. The plan is uh, funded by the Caltrans Sustainable Communities Grant Program, and the plan will gu guide the development of multimodal facilities throughout the unincorporated areas of Contra Costa County. The projects included in the plan will build towards the goal of providing more active transportation infrastructure and facilities in the unincorporated county. Um, improve connectivity in the bike ped network and provide increased access to alternative modes of travel, such as walking, biking, and rolling. Um, the active transportation plan is being developed in, in coordination or consideration with other policy plan, planning documents, such as the CCTA bike ped plan, the county's vision zero plan, the county's climate action plan, and the county's general plan. Currently, the active transportation plan is um, closing out, I guess, phase one of, it, of the, um, the plan, which is focused on, you know, existing issues and, you know, hearing from the, um, the community what the, the existing concerns are out there. Uh, phase one, as I said, yeah, um, focuses on existing issues. We've had um, a few public meetings. We've had targeted stakeholder meetings, which included government entities. So I think uh, a number of you on, on in this number of committee members here have attended those meetings. Um, we were planning to have some mobile workshops in phase one, but due to COVID, we weren't able to have those, those um, mobile workshops. Um, the county, we have launched a, um, a website for, for our active transportation plan. It's called activecontracosta.org. The website includes an interactive map where people can place comments and plot down points of concerns in with throughout the county, both in the unincorporated and county and the cities. The, the website also includes a, a online survey, which uh, people could take. Both the interactive map and the online survey is um, available till, till August 1st. Um, starting later this summer and into the fall, we're going to have a phase two um, outreach, which focuses on, you know, um, comments and discussion on on both um, the county's transportation analysis and the draft, the forthcoming draft active transportation plan. So we're seeking input from both the public and and you stakeholders on on our um, recommendations, our prioritized uh, active transportation projects, and if there are any any concerns in the, um, the first phase of outreach if we missed anything in, that, in, in our um, recommendations or the, the draft plan. Um, so that, that will take, as I mentioned, that will take place you know, later this, this summer and into the fall. And sometime during the winter, we will, um, the county will work with the consultants to revise the active transportation plan and then bring it to the board by February, 2022, which is when the, uh, the grant, the grant award period ends, and that's where we're required to produce a final document. So, yeah, I just wanted to provide that update to the um, the committee here, and um, I'm available to take any questions if anyone's anyone has any 
questions or comments on, on the plan if anyone has any. All right, so um, yeah, any, any questions or comments on the county's active transportation plan efforts? All right, um, any, any public comment? All right, hearing none, um, I already mentioned this, but just in case, again, does anybody have any other items to bring up during public or during this? Okay, um, Margie. Thank you, Robert. Um, I am on the County Connections Advisory Committee, which is a citizens advisory group. And we are actively, um, I guess, trying to rebuild the bench of people that are involved in this committee. We um, seek representation from all the major cities in Central Contra Costa. And so I would ask that you guys in your networks, if you hear people that are active bus users who are interested in trying to improve the, the delivery of bus services to the county, um, I would encourage them to either reach out to me or to their respective cities. The, the application process is pretty straightforward and um, the cities make the recommendation to the County Connections Board. Um, but we are trying to start from basically uh, ground zero. And so it's an opportunity for people to bring together these different initiatives. Thank you. All right, thank you, Margie. And I, I guess one request with that, is there any, do you have any, um, what's the word I'm, I'm like, any documentation or anything as uh, um, County Connection provided like a flyer or announcement? Uh, they are at this point in time, I think turning back to the cities. So if somebody's interested, um, certainly they could reach out to me and I could figure out how to get them connected to the right um, city or into the, the county connections process. Um, that's part of the problem is, you know, it's kind of falling apart. So we're in the process <laughs> of trying to get county connections to help us get it rebuilt. Okay, and and I asked just for a flyer or announcement because if if there was one available, sending it to Colin and then um, distributing I, it. I totally agree with you, and you know they're basically trying to shift it back to the cities, the respective cities. Uh, so again, if somebody's interested, please reach out. We can figure out how to get them connected into the city process, and um, you know get get the ball rolling. All right, uh, thank thank you, Margie. All right. Any other, any other, um, any other business for uh, any of the committee members to share? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on to. I think this is the final item here. Um, upcoming um, subjects for discussion. For any of the committee members, are there any items you would like to see on the next? I think the September agenda. Oli? Yeah, the bridge over Highway 4 for the McCullamy Coast to Crest Trail. By September, we should know a little more about what's going on, about the contractor that is in the process of selection, about potentially when it will be started and finished and that sort of thing, and just a, a generalized report. This is a the CCTA is paying for it. So you guys probably know pretty much what's going on out there. A hey, Colin? Sounds good. So you you want that uh, on, on the agenda for next time? I can work with our other CCTA staff that are leading that project. Yeah, just, just a few words, a couple of paragraphs. Sounds good. Yeah, I've been yelling at uh, the powers that be for the last 18 years about getting that bridge built. I'm pretty proud of the fact that now it's going to get built. All right, thank you, Oli. Uh, I'll go next with Bill, and then after I'll go with Sean. So, uh, Bill, yes, um, can go. Oh, sorry. Uh, what I'm thinking about uh, for next time or sometime soon is the issue of electric bicycles. Uh, there are quite a few around now, and this has nothing to do with the fact that I got one a few weeks ago. Um, but, um, and um, 
very happy with it. You can pedal a lot and, and still get an assist. Anyway, um, there are many issues, especially these being ridden on trails and so on. Um, Richmond has the very first, uh, as far as I know, electric bike share program in the Bay. Um, still, do, I was there the opening day, of course, uh, it was a lot of fun, but it's still, you know, debatable how it's going to work out. There's a small fee and so on. And although it'd be great if we had more cities in the East Bay, you know, uh, destinations, but right now it's just Richmond. And that's another uh, thing we could talk about. Um, uh, there's cost and there's um, the county rebate, which we do, do should get, uh, it's uh, 150 or something like that now, and whether that should be increased. And so there are a lot of aspects uh, to think about um, in this, uh, this area. So I, I think we ought to tackle it sometime. And this is Corey, I'll, I'll just add very briefly to that. Um, for the um, Richmond Bike Share, uh, we're sponsoring a promo for that. Oh. People can use the promo code 511CC and get up to five free unlocks. Uh, you'll have to pay for the mileage or whatever, but um, if you wanted to, if you're ever over in Richmond and want to try it out, we'll uh, unlock it for free. That's great. I'll publicize that, especially in the Richmond bike head. And uh, hopefully, hopefully the world will get around. Uh, Bill, Cor Corey, this is Robert. I, can you remind me again the name of the, um, the bike share operation in Richmond? Yeah, it was, it was Gotcha. Um, yeah. Then Gotcha got bought out by another company, Bolt. Okay. Its official name is Gotcha Powered by Bolt. Yeah. <laughs> and, okay. Uh, while we were, we were got by Gotcha and the bike stayed on the, we're on a boat for a long time and so on. And the date gets, kept getting postponed and postponed, but Finally, at last we have it, and Bolt was very nice. They passed out free helmets and so on. Um, and, you know, bikes seem fine. So, um, yeah, hopefully they, they get more, more places. If yeah, I could rolling. make a comment too, uh, for the electric bikes, I thought you were going to go in a different direction, which, what, hello, this is Eric Owens again, which is uh, in Concord and Walnut Creek, we have the canal trails. And like you said, there's very often people who are screaming through there on e-bikes. I, like you, have an e-bike. I regularly bike without it as well. But I did notice there are you know, some people stick on the pedestrian areas and are going rather fast. I don't know if there's some sort of signage that you as a committee could propose or bring out or something to, you know, like the speed limit for this for e-bikes is 20 miles per hour. I believe that's state law, but maybe to reinforce that in areas where there is much more pedestrian traffic as well. Oh yeah, we've been dealing with that issue for quite a while on the, in the uh, bike ped, Richmond Bike Ped Committee. And for electric bikes, we were dealing with it uh, on regular bikes that tend, you know, with many people being home, there's a lot of people who exercise and riding their, carbon fiber is zipping along the trail. The speed limit on the Bay Trail is 15, not 20. Um, some of the bikes, uh, some of the bikes actually cut out after 20 miles an hour. Um, the Bolt Company, they, they say, and I have no idea how they do this, uh, that their bikes are limited to 15 miles an hour on the Bay Trail. I don't know if it's some kind of strange GPS or however they do it, but that's what they say. So if that's possible, uh, somehow maybe that could be translated to other trails. Uh, but yeah, no, that's, that's a very big issue about people being endangered by electric bikes. And of course, there's the issue of, well, I don't know if they have mountain electric bikes, but you know, some people are gonna, usually they have wider tires anyway. Some people are gonna try to ride them on uh, park service trails as well. So. Um, yeah, there's, there needs to be enforcement. We're kind of scratching our heads about how to do it. Signage, yes, was a problem, or was an issue. Um, enforcement, that's tough, especially these days with the police budgets being cut. Uh, the police in Richmond had a, there was a youth group called the Rangers. I don't know if they still have it, 
but um, they're, what they would do is just kind of spot riders and maybe zap them with a radar or something like that and then report to their, uh, to the real police. But, you know, by then the people are down the line and, you know, it's just, um, it's, a, it's a tough problem enforcement. It is. Um, we need a lot of public awareness and uh, public pressure. And I think the signage too. Um, and hopefully, uh, because it's, it's just going to happen. Um, it's just increasing. I went to another some meeting around town and all the bikes in the rack were electric. <laughs> Not many, but, you know, five or six of them. Um, so we have to deal with it somehow. Uh, Eric, uh, thanks for your comment. Unfortunately, you know, you, you, you talk about the uh, canal trail. Unfortunately, on this call, we have, uh, or I would say this, the canal trail is um, managed by the East Bay Regional Park District. Unfortunately, we have a uh, East Bay Regional Park District rep on this call, so they'll mm -hmm. know your comment. So, yeah. mm -hmm. um, I, I did, uh, Sean, you did have your, your hand up earlier, so I just want to mm -hmm. make sure. Yes, um, thank you, Robert. Uh, yeah, we, the park district manages the Contra Costa Canal, but there's also the Ignacio, which is, I believe, operated by Walnut Creek. Um, but yes, we've, we've heard that, we've heard comments like that very similarly. And yes, they do have e-mountain bikes and our park advisory committee will be um, discussing this is, issue of e-bikes um, and our current policy around them, mainly, I think, in our backcountry uh, trails, but um, as you know, we we updated our ordinance in 2018 to allow e-bikes on the Iron Horse Trail, the Delta De Anza Trail, and a handful of others. I think it's about eight trails throughout the park district. Um, and yeah, we're 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 seeing heavy use, and then adding additional modes. So there there is some concern around it. But um, my my comment was actually. Um, adding to um, Oli's request for agenda items um, was, was the McCormick Coast Crest Trail. Yes, you should be proud of that, Oli. And maybe add in there, Colin, the, um, the San Ramon, the uh, Bollinger Canyon overcrossing update on that, when that might go. I, I think it's fully funded, but I'm not sure, but you don't have to tell me now. Um, and then I am also curious about um, <laughs> whether we'll see another PBTF uh, competitive round of uh, a grant fund, or, sorry, Measure J funding, um, a call for that. And, um, you know, you, again, just an update on that next time uh, when, when we might expect that and maybe how much funding might be available. I know it's tough right now with, with the PBTF pandemic. PBTF or TF? What is that? Sorry, p p pedestrian P bicycle P P transportation P funding. Yeah, the PB. Oh. The, the competitive grant rounds for um, for bike and ped projects throughout Contra Costa. And Bill, if you recall, it's the one, the PBTF where in, in, in years past, we take the field trip to the different project, you know, proposed projects around the county. So yeah, that, that program. Which is the only reason I want to do it again, Robert, <laughs> is to go on a field trip with you guys. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Sean. Um, any uh, other... Maybe... Any yeah, maybe one more comment is uh, I would propose we call that the Bruce Oli Memorial Bridge and just bring it up as maybe, you know, as part of the project when you discuss it next time is to, you know, have signage on there of a 15 mile per hour limit for bicycles. It seems like that's a project you do have some control over and can try to bring forth that type of signage as a, you know, to set a standard for moving forward. All right. Thank you, Eric. All right. Um, if any other final final um, comments to, for this item at any other agenda items? All right. Seeing none, I think we'll move on to the last item, which is adjournment. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, adjournment. So yeah, this meeting is adjourned. Our next meeting will be on, proposed for September 27th at 11 a.m. I'm assuming it still should be virtual, so. Robert, I'm sorry to have missed your email and I was really looking forward to saying this meeting is adjourned, but well, you deserve it. <laughs> well, yeah, we, luckily, fortunately we finished early. I'll, I'll let you do the next one, Bill, yeah. so. Okay, um, one of these days, you know, we'll be able to 
meet again in that uh, room that you're in, uh, Ms. John. Um, but I hope it comes soon. I, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I'm um, getting a little tired of seeing heads without bodies. <laughs>